uh, procedural notes. This session will be held electronically as per section 19, one of the town's procedural bylaw number 6228-19 as amended due to the COVID-19 situation. Councilor Hayden, a motion to approve the agenda. Moved by Councilor Thompson, seconded by Councilor Gallo. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? Opposed, that carries. Any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. Uh, consideration of items requiring discussion. We have 4.1, Council Asset Management Workshop. Um, I guess I'll pass it over to Ms. Wainwright Van Kessel, who will do some introductions and, uh, and do the presentation. So Ms. Wainwright Van Kessel, floor is yours. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just gonna share my screen just to get us started here. So this evening, um, we are going to be discussing the second generation asset management plan that the town is working on developing. Through our asset management journey, uh, we did have an approved asset management plan as of 2018, which was the first asset management plan we had underway. In 2019, uh, council approved a strategic asset management policy. And today we're here as part of our development of our second generation asset management plan. And what that does is it establishes service levels for um, specific asset classes. Beyond this, there are future requirements for asset management and those will be happening starting into next year. The next stage in asset management planning includes the uh, continued compliance with the Ontario regulations um, that we are required to meet. We will clearly identify and define service levels for core assets and continue uh, future capital planning decisions based on service levels uh, requirements for assets. Today's presentation is going to address a number of items, including <laughs> roles and responsibilities of key stakeholders, identifying the elements that support decision making, and explain the importance of service levels, asset service levels, and capital planning. We'll also outline the progress since 2018 and explore the next steps. To do this, uh, we have our consultants from Public Sector Digest here to help us uh, with our asset management uh, second generation plan uh, development. They are helping us with defining the service levels for the various asset classes, and they are also helping us by operationalize our asset management plan through our asset management planning software, which will help us develop longer term capital planning as we move forward. So at this point, I would like to invite Mai and Jordan from Public Sector Digest to take over on the presentation. Um, they are providing some information for you. There is no decisions to be made or required this evening. This is an opportunity for them to present information to you as we develop our asset management plan. So uh, Mai, I believe you're starting off. Yes, thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. Um, Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I want to share my screen so we can get this presentation started. Rachel, please let me know if you can see the screen. Yes, we can see your presentation. All right, thank you so much. All righty, good, e good, e good evening, everyone. Um, uh, as Rachel mentioned, my name is May Abdu. Uh, I will be co-facilitating this training session. And beyond that, I am also the project lead working with the town on, the, on their next iteration of the asset management plan that you will be seeing hopefully in the next few months. Uh, with us, uh, we have Jordan Gonda, uh, one of our asset management uh, consultants, who will be leading the um, uh, the second half of the presentation while I lead the first. Uh, and uh, just for your information, I will be leaving at the end of that first half. Unfortunately, I cannot stay for the entirety of the presentation. Uh, I would love to, but Jordan has over four, you know, um, 
he's had experiences with four hour council training sessions before, so you are in good hands. In terms of the agenda for today, as Rachel mentioned, we wanna focus first on roles and responsibilities, um, not just for council, but also key other key stakeholders uh, in terms of the asset management program. And then I wanted to take a look at um, the different lenses to look at asset management. So looking at an international and Canadian approach, and then zooming into Aurora's situation and comparing that the, the 2018 asset management plan to what you can expect in the 2020 asset management plan. Uh, from there, we can take a break uh, and then delve deeper into the elements, uh, um, the various elements of asset management and how that ties into decision making and being more proactive with our assets um, and how that ties into the asset management plan as well. In terms of expectations for today, again, to reiterate what Rachel said, this is purely an educational session. We are not seeking any kind of uh, information or um, motions from council today. The focus of today is to look at um, the, the different responsibilities that council holds, um, the importance of aligning with uh, strategic documents with your with your various reporting and um, documentation that you have, and also looking at um, the data and the, and the information that you have that drive your decisions. A lot of the time, we see that uh, uh, council uh, may be uh, uh, prioritizing based on worst first approach. We see municipalities or council. Uh, that are sometimes um, influenced heavily by political or social pressures. So part of asset management is looking at all of those issues because they do impact your um, asset management program, but also looking at how that aligns with your strategic goals and uh, your corporate objectives. And I think the most important piece is how that ties into the levels of service that you are providing your public and your residents. Um, and we'll take a look at how that ties into the regulation. But in my opinion, that is really the fundamental piece that the um, regulation really tries to hammer home is what are the level of service metrics that you are providing to your public and how can you sustain them? So we'll take a look at that today. In terms of uh, questions, uh, we will be holding those off until the end of our presentation. Um, so um, please feel free to accumulate those until the end of that presentation. So starting off with roles and responsibilities here, uh, when we look at council's uh, responsibilities, the first ones that, um, that I really focus on are the policy and the direction of the asset management program. Uh, when we talk about the policy, that was something that was due in 2019, that you approved in 2019. But when we look at the direction of the asset management program, uh, that's really talking about uh, how do you align with your strategic policies and your strategic documents? Uh, and how do you prioritize the project and activities and the assets um, that need uh, maintenance, rehab, or replacement? So it's looking at prioritizing. Um, your decision-making process based on accurate data, objective data, um, and being as proactive as we can be. So that's really, to me, that's the first responsibility that council has. The second uh, um, uh, highest responsibility is approving the level of service metrics and the key performance indicators. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the Ontario regulation really focuses on uh, the levels of service that you are providing and that you will be proposing to provide later in 2025. Um, so council's responsibility is a, to approve those levels of service and uh, where possible to recommend uh, uh, changes, improvements, uh, decreases perhaps in the levels of service that then staff can take uh, and consider whether that's sustainable or not. So really that to me is the um, uh, the two major umbrella responsibilities. And, and then a lot of other responsibilities fall under that, uh, such as approving the capital and the operating budget, because cost and, and life cycle costs 
uh, factors heavily into the direction and the levels of service that are provided. Um, uh, and also prioritizing the effective stewardship of your assets by an ongoing policy uh, review and ongoing budget review that as well feeds into the direction of the asset management program and feeds into the levels of service that you are providing. Uh, and Jordan will be going into more detail uh, in terms of what are those levels of service metrics look like um, and how you can start tracking them um, and using them to drive your decisions. When we look at the, um, the uh, leadership team and the responsibilities that they have, Really, without having a leadership team or a, an asset management champion, uh, asset management is going to fail, right? As a program, you need someone to, uh, someone or some ones as a team to spearhead and oversee uh, the the goals, the um, the coordination of staff. So, really, that is the major uh, um, the major responsibility of the leadership team to oversee and to monitor those levels of service that are being provided and make recommendations to council where they see fit. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about that, but really without uh, the people aspect, the people um, and the key stakeholders uh, that monitor and manage the assets and the services, um, asset management is not sustainable. And that brings me to the departmental staff. So when we're talking about, um, when we talk about council, we're always talking about council buy-in and getting that senior management and council to be receptive to asset management. And that is very important because you need that top-down approach, but also you need the departmental staff, those asset owners, the day-to-day -day, day -day operators to also buy in. Uh, if you expect them to um, document information collect more information and more attributes, um, then there has to be a really good reason for them to do that, right? They need to understand the value of tracking that information and collecting it and documenting it um, and how that plays into asset management. So departmental staff are responsible for implementing and actually maintaining those levels of service. And as we look at 2025, when the town will start defining its uh, proposed levels of service. So when you choose to either increase or de decrease a level of service, uh, the, the departmental staff are the ones that are going to be implementing those changes. And so they have a lot of control and a lot of power uh, in how well uh, those services are, are uh, managed. Um, one of the key uh, responsibilities, whether it's council, whether it's leadership team, is also ensuring that, is, that there's adequate resourcing and capacity at the departmental level so that uh, no one person or no one team is uh, over capacity when it comes to ma managing asset management. Uh, and this is not the case at the town, but we often we see that asset management is um, uh, typically either an exercise for finance or it's an exercise that that's done on, on the side of the um, of the desk um, and it's not prioritized and moving forward with the ontario regulation and future regulations uh, asset management is something that is multidisciplinary it is uh, uh it is based on teamwork um, and really trying to break up those silos and then finally the last piece or the last uh, role that we want to focus on is public, is the public, because ultimately those are the levels of service that we are providing to the public and the expectations that they have will influence or impact um, you know, the decisions we, uh, we go with, right? So in terms of uh, council and the leadership team, uh, you have committed yourself to engaging with the public uh, providing public engagement opportunities, whether it's a survey or a mail out or um, whatever you have, you know, whatever is um, possible in this COVID era. Uh, but really, it's important to engage the public to understand what kind of level of service expectations they have uh, and what is realistic. Um, and a lot of times you see that public want all of the service without, you know, all of the services without the tax implications. 
Um, so there needs to be a little bit of an education piece there so that they can understand the relationship between the performance and the service level that they're getting and how that ties into the life cycle costs, the condition of our assets, and the risk that we're able to tolerate. Um, in terms of requirements to engage the public, that is not something that you need to do until uh, later on, around 2024 and, or 2025. Once staff have had a good grasp on what level of service trends they are providing, um, and they have an idea of what they are able to provide as well with the existing uh, funding levels, that's when I would recommend to engage the public to see what kind of level of service expectations they have. So really, that is the focus um, um, for each the stakeholder, or those are the responsibilities. And it's going to tie heavily into the success of your asset management program and overall um, um, kind of the sustainable nature of um, the town. Now, looking at that bigger lens, as I said, uh, from a, an international perspective, even before we go into the Canadian perspective, uh, this is a, a graph from the Global Risk Report from 2019 that was developed by the World Economic Forum. Um, and they basically show the, the major risks that internationally countries struggle with. Uh, so you'll see on the x-axis or that horizontal um, axis, you have the likelihood of that risk, the probability of that risk. And on the vertical or the y-axis, you have the impact or that consequence of that risk. Um, and you'll see all the way at the top on that um, um, that uh, top right, uh, you see risks like extreme weather uh, events, you see climate change mitigation failures, natural disasters, and those are actual risks that we see on a Canadian level, and uh, the, the town of Aurora has definitely seen those uh, risks when it comes to managing their assets, whether it's from a capacity uh, perspective, from a um, deterioration of their assets, or just from providing the, the level of service that they provide when we're talking about um, uh, things like winter control and uh, drainage, flooding. Um, all of those issues are tied to that kind of risk. And then when you look uh, closer to the middle, uh, what I have highlighted is failure of critical infrastructure. And of course, when we're talking about critical infrastructure, we're talking about roads, bridges, water, wastewater, all of those critical infrastructures. And so this is really an international risk and concern um, and not just the Canadian one. And then of course, when you look at the Canadian perspective, um, it is certainly a risk that, we, that we've seen that is consistently growing as well. Uh, these are stats from the Asset Management of Ontario, uh, the AMO, they ran a report or a study a few years ago. Uh, so I would imagine that these numbers are even higher today. But they concluded that about 60% of Canada's infrastructure is owned by municipal governments such as yourself. And that was about $1.1 trillion in value of just core assets. Uh, and when we mention core assets, uh, we're talking about roads, bridges and structural culverts, water, wastewater, and storm. So I'm not even talking about vehicles, machinery and equipment, buildings, uh, land improvement assets, those are non-core assets that feed into um, the service delivery um, of the town. So that 1.1 trillion, you could easily double that if you're looking at the entire value of your assets, of Canadian assets. Uh, and what that looks like from a household perspective is that's about $80,000 of shared value there. And we'll compare that in a few uh, uh, later slides to what the Aurora value looks like. But about 35% of those assets are in need of attention. Um, and by need of attention, we mean they are in very poor condition, they are in critical um, con condition or performance and require immediate intervention. Um, and as of recently, that number has increased to 40, 43, 45. Um, and just in Ontario, so we're not even looking at Canada, just in Ontario, that number is a little bit higher. And again, we'll compare that in a few later slides to what that looks like in Aurora. 
So why is it important to talk about this? It's because these assets are tied to services that you uh, provide and that municipalities provide. So when we're looking at water, for example, whether it's treatment facilities, pipes, pumping stations, um, reservoirs, storage tanks, these are all assets that provide clean drinking water to the public. That's really the, the, the main goal and service that they're providing. About 60% of the water infrastructure in Canada has been pre-constructed pre-2000, with the majority of them being um, you know, in that 1960s to 1980s. Uh, nearly 30% of water reservoirs were constructed before 1970. When we compare that to uh, Aurora, about 66% of the town's water infrastructure was built prior to 2000, with many of the assets built in the 1940s around World War II, right? So uh, a lot of our assets are aging, and it's important to uh, ensure that the service that they are providing and the performance and their condition are maintained. When we look at roads, for example, roads and bridges, uh, Canada has enough roads in poor to very poor condition to get us halfway to the moon. So that's about 150,000 kilometers worth of poor to very poor um, roads and structures. And that's an interesting comparison, but it just shows how much assets we have uh, and their impact on um, the level of service that we can provide. Uh, and even beyond that, when you look at roads and bridges, um, not only are they providing a transportation uh, service, they are also tied to fire services and emergency service. When we talk about levels of service tied uh, uh, to emergency services reaching uh, their destination in you know, less than four minutes, for example, that's a level of service that is going to be heavily impacted if our roads and our bridges are in uh, poor condition and are not performing at the level of service that we need them to perform at. When we look at recreation facilities, for example, these are facilities that provide uh, quality of life, they provide mental and physical well being to our residents. Uh, and it's shown that about one in three recreational facilities will require significant capital reinvestment to address their deteriorating condition. Uh, so when we think of when you think of the various facilities that the town uh, owns and manages like the family leisure complex that was built in 1981, uh, the factory theater that was built in 1970, the soccer, the tennis clubhouse, all of these are important facilities that provide services to our residents. Um, and the issue a lot of the times with uh, buildings is they are just one big black box, right? We don't know um, uh, a lot of detail or a lot of information about them. Um, and this is an issue that a lot of municipalities, the majority of municipalities deal with because um, they have never really broken out their buildings into the major components, uh, whether it's roofing, HVAC, we're talking about uh, electrical, for example. Those are all major components that fail at different stages. And unless we have that appropriate level of detail, um, it's going to be a hidden failure. And Jordan will talk, will speak a little bit more about that, that level of detail and how that changes from one asset class to another. And then finally, when we're talking about a level of service tied to the underground infrastructure, this is an unseen uh, issue. Um, many of the uh, uh, water mains, about 67% of the water mains in the town of Aurora were built prior to 1990. Right. Uh, and when it comes to water, for example, it is very difficult to determine the direct condition of those pipes um, because we don't typically CCTV them. Right. We don't inspect them because of their pressurized nature. Um, so these are assets that are out of sight and sometimes out of mind. And they're a lot harder to um, uh, to maintain and manage. Um, about 30 percent of Canadian Canada's uh, mains, whether it's water, storm or sewer, are either in fair or worse condition. And as I mentioned in the beginning with that global risk where we have climate change and extreme weather um, um, risks, those are really putting a toll on uh, the underground system, on the underground network when it comes to capacity, when it comes to um, um, the service that they're, they're able to provide. 
Uh, and even when you look at Storm, for, exa for example, I, I typically call that the forgotten child of the underground because it's not until something major fails um, that Storm is typically uh, reviewed. Um, and yet, if, if it were to fail, it could have catastrophic consequences, not just on the Storm network, but also on the road and other right-of-way assets. So all of that is to say it's very important to look at developing an asset management program and an asset management plan that not only looks at our assets and the documents and the studies and the reports that we uh, develop and inspect, um, but also looking at um, uh, what are those reports and information and data and our, our, our database spitting out for us, right? Um, you know, uh, you know uh, to be informal a little bit, garbage in is going to be garbage out, right? Uh, the, the database and the asset management program is only as good as the information that we feed it. Um, and so the information that it outputs, such as the financial plan, the capital plan, the maintenance uh, plan, uh, service level uh, analysis, all of those um, outputs are determined by the the quality and the um, the the quality and the comprehensive comprehensiveness of the data that we feed it. And one of the most important things that uh, is an output to asset management is provincial and even federal um, uh, submissions, right? So when you look at the OREG, the Ontario regulation um, requirements, um, but also looking at grants and funding opportunities, if if you if municipalities are unable to um, show that they are being um, sustainable, that they are doing their due diligence to manage their assets as proactively as they can, it is going to be difficult to justify funding or grants, right? And we see now with a lot of grants and funding, they will ask you if you have an asset management plan and if it's, if the issue that um, that you are looking at is identified in that plan. So looking at, um, um, so I wanted to look a little bit into the asset management uh, history and, uh, you know, why we are where we are today in terms of this Ontario regulation. Um, and I apologize, I think I hear some background noise. That, is there anyone? Okay, maybe I'm, I'm uh, hearing things. So looking at the asset management history here, uh, asset management is something that municipalities have been doing for a long, long time. It just wasn't called asset management. It's something that's constantly evolving. Um, and in future iterations of the plan, especially when, when uh, you look at the 2018 asset management plan and how we're going to compare it to the 2020, there are massive improvements, right? Um, so it really first started with uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities in 2001, uh, building a guide for municipal infrastructure, for sustainable infrastructure. And then in 2009, PSAP came out, the Public Sector Accounting Board came out um, with requirements and standards around how to account for tangible capital assets, um, at least from a financial perspective. Unfortunately, what, they, what the PSAP did not do is it did not define uh, the hierarchy, the level of detail, and the kind of information that needs to be tracked and inventory. Um, and we see the ramifications of that today, depending on if you are a municipality that opted to go for more detail or less detail, um, it can either make it easier or harder for you uh, with, with the, the regulations this time around. And then in 2020, uh, 2012 and 2014, uh, more regulations and guides came out. And of course, in 2014, the federal gas tax fund was developed to provide um, a funding for municipalities. And they also mandated that municipalities have an asset management plan developed. Um, and most of the asset management plans that we see today uh, that we compare to are from 2016. Uh, Aurora is a little bit different. Um, uh, you updated it in 2018. And that's really where we are today with the, the Ontario Regulation 588.17 as part of the Infrastructure for Jobs and Prosperity Act uh, they outlined specific requirements for the asset management plans uh, for both the core and the non-core assets. And they also provided a framework for the delivery of 
uh, funding for the next 10 years uh, across the province. So when we look at uh, the Ontario 588.17 regulation, the first piece was that policy, as we mentioned. Um, uh, the really the, the focus of that policy was uh, roles and responsibilities as we identified earlier today, um, but also identifying principles and commitments that municipalities were going to hold themselves accountable to, whether it was a commitment to consider a climate change initiative, whether it was a commitment to engage your public at one point, um, all of those were principles that were built into the policy. Uh, and it wasn't until um, recently that a lot of municipalities started building their asset management plans. Um, uh, believe it or, or not, Aurora is really advanced when it comes to building its asset management plan. Um, many of the municipalities that we work with today are still at that data refinement piece, looking at their data, looking at their inventory, um, and trying to build that. Uh, and so now looking at the asset management plan, it's only recently that the province actually pushed the dates out by a year. So previously, it used to be July of 2021 that phase one was due, uh, uh, same thing with phase two, it was due in 2023. Um, but because of the need, because of the amount of municipalities that were just not there, um, they pushed it out by a year. Um, so in terms of the first uh, phase, which is what the next iteration of the asset management plan that you'll be seeing will, will be, um, it focuses on core assets, uh, which are your roads, your bridges, culverts, water, wastewater, and storm. Uh, and when we talk about water, wastewater, and storm, uh, we are talking about anything that is tied to the transmission, the collection, the distribution, the management of those uh, networks, not just the linear. And so uh, some of the requirements are uh, a summary of the health of those assets, uh, identifying the current service uh, levels that you are providing, but also looking at uh, to provide that level of service, what kind of life cycle activities are you performing or what kind of uh, risk mitigation strategies do you have in place to be able to provide those current levels of service? And then, of course, tied to that is the cost. What is the life cycle cost uh, to maintain that current level of service? And we, when we talk about cost, we're talking about um, construction costs, maintenance costs, rehabilitation costs, uh, and replacement and disposal costs. So we're looking at the entire life of that asset and figuring out how, how much does it cost to maintain this, this asset and this service. Um, and then ultimately, we also want to look at growth, right? So we're not just looking at your capital and operating, we're also looking at growth and how that's going to impact um, uh, the levels of service that you provide um, and expectations uh, uh, that your public will have as well. As part of the asset management plan, we're also looking at the non-core assets, not in as much detail, but we are making sure that the, um, the value of those assets are, are correct, that they're accurate, they are not overvalued or undervalued. Um, but when it comes to the non-core, uh, that's really going to be the focus of 2024. Uh, that's really when uh, municipalities will extend um, all of the things that they're doing in 2022 to the non-core assets. And then finally, come 2025, uh, municipalities will have the opportunity to propose levels of service. Uh, and with those uh, changes, whether it's an increase or a decrease, municipalities have to show that they can actually sustain these changes. So from a, a strategy standpoint and from a cost standpoint, um, uh, municipalities have to prove that they can actually sustain these changes. And uh, they also have to put risk mitigation strategies in place in case there are funding shortfalls. Uh, so really the province is looking at municipalities uh, being accountable for the level of service that they're providing, being accountable for the changes that they are, are, um, are uh, implementing in their levels of service. Um, I mean, I, I worked for a municipality uh, prior to working with PSD. And uh, one of the biggest issues with the, was that they wanted to build a new arena, right? That was a level of service that they wanted to provide. And they certainly had the capital, um, but they did not have the operating to 
sustain or maintain that that asset and that service. And ultimately, because there was no uh, uh, strong asset management direction, that arena was built and um, it impacted the level of service that they were providing for that entire asset class, right? So it's all about being accountable, being transparent, and uh, aligning with your strategic goals at the end of the day. Now that's from a, a high level uh, um, perspective, looking at Aurora's position um, in Aurora's case, you also uh, provide services. So if we're talking about transportation, uh, you have almost 200 kilometers worth of roads um, that provide transportation for people, for goods, um, uh, and for uh, services. Um, when we're talking about parks and recreational facilities, you have over 700 acres of open space and parkland. Um, you have 33 playgrounds all over the town. Um, that And that is an important service, especially when you look at COVID. Now, those are services that uh, people certainly want to take advantage of. And uh, there's going to be more pressure around those kinds of services, right? The outdoors type. Even when you look at vehicles and equipment, uh, the town of Aurora has over 90 vehicles uh, and attachments that support the delivery of various uh, transportation, protection, and recreational services. So it's a lot of assets, and it's important to um, have a, a, an asset management program um, that is realistic, that is um, data-driven and objective as much as possible. Uh, so comparing a little bit to the 2018 asset management plan and what you can expect in the 2020 asset management plan, in the 2018 uh, AMP, uh, the, the town had an overall value of $1.3 billion in terms of assets. This is the amount of assets that you had. Uh, and keep in mind as we go through these that the 2018 asset management plan was just a screenshot in time. It was very dependent on the information that was being fed. Um, and um, and the, um, the strategies that were built in the system or in the database. And so that is something that is constantly being improved, constantly being updated. And we are doing that right now through uh, the, the many workshops that we've had with staff um, and refining the data as we go along. But in terms of uh, what that looks like per household, that's about $67,000 per household. And if you think back to the, the first couple of slides um, where we looked at the Canadian uh, stats, uh, there was about 80,000 of share uh, value uh, of shared assets there. And that to me makes sense because the, the town of Aurora is densely populated if you look at its urban density compared to a lot of other Canadian municipalities. Even if you compare it to uh, a neighboring municipality like East Willenberry, uh, where you have around the same amount of um, replacement cost value, but they om they have almost half the the number of households uh, and, and the tax base. So it is a unique situation. Every municipality has its own you know set of of uh, um, complexities and um, unique situations. But it's constantly evolving the more we improve and update the information. When we look at condition, um, the 2018 asset management plan identified that about $35 million uh, worth of assets were in poor condition. And you'll notice that none of them were in very poor, um, with the majority of the assets being in good or fair condition. Now, I want you to keep in mind that a lot of these assets were assessed based on age. Right, especially for the non-linear assets, many of them were assessed based on age. And so age is not always the best determinant of performance. Uh, sometimes you will have vehicles, for example, that are way past their service life, their estimated useful life, but they are still functional and they are still working. So uh, I, again, we have to look at what is what data are we feeding into our asset management program? How often are we updating our information? Um, and uh, is the information reliable, right? And so come the 2020 asset management plan, you may see significant changes 
in the overall condition. You might see more assets in the very poor. You may see more assets or less assets in the good to very good, right? And it's always going to change uh, to be more accurate uh, uh, to what is on the field, to what the, the department uh, staff and the asset owners see. Now, if you were to look at the asset rating summary, this is just a health this was a screenshot of the, the health of your assets in 2018, you'll notice that a lot of the ratings are B or C when it comes to assets. Um, and to give you a, an idea of the rating, uh, anything that was provided or given a, a rating of A was an asset that uh, was an overall excellent condition. It had at least 80% of its life left. Uh, it had a performance and energy efficiency of at least 90%. Um, so anything that's in the B, C, or D uh, rating uh, is a little bit less than that. And again, so this shows that depending on the information that we're feeding it, the health of our assets are going to look very different. Uh, and this ties very heavily into the annual requirements and the tax implications or the tax levy um, and the financial strategy, strategy that comes out of the asset management plan. Uh, because ultimately, depending on the health of your assets, that's going to impact when certain activities certain strategies need to be put in place. And so this ties nicely into um, your 10-year capital reinvestment rate or, or a, a plan. When you look at the activities and the projects that have been prioritized every year, you have to look at how they tie back into uh, your overall asset management direction, uh, how they tie or align with strategic goals and, and documents but also how do they impact the level of service that you're providing? Um, th that's very important. As of 2019, uh, 2018, Aurora had a backlog of $67 uh, million. This backlog is, um, is, can fluctuate. It, it is based on um, what kind of activities does the town focus on? Do you focus on maintenance and um, operating? Do you focus on rehab? Where does the bulk of your funding go? And how does that impact the level of service that you are trying to provide? Um, and you know, how long is it gonna take to bridge or bridge that deficit or that annual requirement? When we look at the uh, 2020 asset management plan, we are going to be focusing much more on that financial strategy piece to look at how it's going to impact uh, the average average resident or the average household and how that's going to impact uh, their their uh, tax level uh, or their taxes. And that's not something the 2018 uh, plan went into too much depth into, but it is certainly something that we will be focusing on for the 2020. Now, when we're looking at Funding. Now that we're talking about financial strategies, we often see that council is typically more interested or concerned with growth or service enhancement enhancement uh, when it comes to um, uh, assets and projects, and that's really just the tip of the of the pyramid. Uh, when we're looking at um, aligning with strategic goals, aligning with the levels of service that are defined. Growth and service enhancements, enhancements are typically the last thing you want to look at. That's really once you've reached a sustainable uh, level of, um, um, of uh, service and uh, funding, that's when you can really look at growth and service enhancements. The first thing that we want to look at and understand uh, are the requirements around bridging that deficit as it relates to operating and maintenance, as it relates to um, a renewal and rehabilitation costs. And it's only until we were confident in our fundamentals and actually managing the assets and the asset portfolio that we have, that we can then look at building um, uh, new assets, uh, you know, and, and, and increasing or improving our services. And this really just speaks to that, again, looking at it from an annual perspective and how that's impacted or how that's um, divided up for each asset class. Um, so when we're looking at this, um, the asset management program and, and the asset management plan, 
we're looking at what can we improve from this iteration, from the 2018 iteration to the current iteration, um, whether it's data, whether it's people, processes, or even the accuracy and the, the, the uh, comprehens comprehensiveness of our financial strategy. And a really nice uh, um, a graph that I, uh, that I like in the 2018 asset management plan was this spider graph or radar graph, however you like to call it. Uh, and basically what that showed was areas where the municipality was advanced and areas where there was opportunity to, uh, to improve. So in terms of um, uh, things like levels of service, risk management, KPIs, decision-making, sustainability, all of those aspects or elements that you see that are, um, that are at the lower rungs, those, the, the zero, one, or twos, those are really the areas where you have most room for improvement. Uh, and those are the areas that uh, we have been tackling for this iteration of the plan, looking to improve those for the 2020 plan as we move forward. But then if you look at other things like uh, capital delivery, the capital plan, the asset register data, um, and even if you look at a demand forecasting, uh, those are more advanced. The, the, the talent is a little bit more advanced in those areas. Uh, and so it really it's all about triaging what are our priorities, what are the um, elements that we need to improve uh, to be able to manage our assets proactively and to be able to provide that level of service. Um, and because ultimately, asset management is only as strong as the uh, people and the tools that are available. Um, that is really, you know, something that I want to emphasize that without the people, the right people, the right expertise and the tools uh, uh, that are necessary being available, um, uh, asset management is going to be very difficult to maintain and to, uh, to make us successful. Right. You need to beyond just having the asset portfolio and having um, the system in place, you need to build the culture around asset management. You want to have buy in from the top, buy in from the bottom um, and ultimately have uh, champions or um, or individuals that are uh, passionate about. About uh, moving asset management forward. Um, and that's really the only way that, um, uh, you know, asset management can continue being a sustainable uh, system. And when you look at the province and what they expect uh, uh, in terms of proposed levels of service, in terms of identifying your strategies and your risk mitigation uh, strategies and all of that detail, it's not unless you have uh, the people, documentation, succession planning, governance strategies uh, built that that can actually happen. Uh, and, and so that brings me to the end of this section. Um, um, Mr. Chair, we have a, a five minute break uh, scheduled. Is that something something council would be interesting interested in um, taking at this time or would you like to move uh, forward? Thank you. Uh, council, would, would everyone like to just continue or would you like to take a five minute break at this time? Or just continue and then we can take a break. I, I think there's another, maybe there's another point uh, later on that we can have a break. So everyone just want to continue for now and then we can take that break uh, a little bit later. Is that good? Everyone good with that? Okay. Floor is yours. Excellent. So I will um, uh, unshare my screen and pass it on to Jordan to uh, go into the details and the elements that are that are uh, that make up asset management, um, and this is really going to be um, important because when you look at the 2020 asset management plan in a few months from now, uh, we want to keep that lens that we were talking about. We want to focus on the uh, overall direction, the alignment with strategic um, documents, uh, and really focusing on the data driving the decisions uh, and being as objective and proactive as possible. Um, so Jordan, I will unshare now and you can take it away.
Thank you, May. Okay, so we, we began today by we began today by discussing the current position of the town of Aurora, um, but now we're taking a step forward. So, for, so what is asset management? It's um, there's really if you want to take away one thing from today, it's about that we're trying to find a balance. Everything that we do is about trying to find value and trying to realize the most value from everything that we own. So let's take a simple example. Say we have uh, the Stronach Arena. We have decisions. We have decisions. Maybe we want to uh, upsize a pool. Maybe we want to increase the service hours. But we got to understand that there's different competing demands at play. Um, what I'm going to go over today are ways that we can look at balancing these different demands. So first off, we can look at the performance. How satisfied are the users of, of uh, the arena? What condition is it in? Uh, what's the cost? What's the cost to maintain, to operate? What are the risks if something fails? So you can imagine if we wanna upgrade something in the arena that comes with the cost. Likewise, maybe we wanna cut back on our O&M costs, but maybe that means we take on more risk. Maybe that means we risk having failure of equipment. You know, there's no right answer for what the balance is, but the takeaway here is that we want to try to find a level that's sustainable and recognizing that just going after performance or just minimizing cost isn't always the best answer. So the, the approach is quite simple, but the challenge here is how can we quantify these different trade-offs? How can we understand the cost, performance, and risk so we can find a level that works? Well, we can start off by asking a few questions. You know, some simple questions, things about our, our uh, infrastructure, maybe what do we own and where is it? How many kilometers of roads? How many kilometers of sewer pipes? Do we have things mapped out? Do we know what it's worth even? Do we know, we might know the book value, the historical cost, but we know over time construction practices change, technology changes. If we had to replace something, you no, know, do we know how much that would be? If we can't know the cost of replacing, it means that our budgets might not be that accurate. Can we also answer what condition something is in? How close is it to replacement? Even what do we need to do? You know, do we need to replace or maybe we can do different kinds of maintenance? When do we need to take these actions? How much money do we need? How do we even achieve sustainability? You know, we saw earlier we have um, funding gaps, deficits, long term, how can we find something that's sustainable? All those questions there are, are key questions that should go into developing your asset management plan. They're the questions that are asked as part of Ontario's Building It Together guide. But in my professional experience, there's also two other questions we want to ask when undertaking this. It's also, do we still need what we own? You know, a good example is, um, do we still need a, uh, that pool? Maybe we do, maybe we don't. Uh, maybe over time with modernization, we don't need uh, as many pumps uh, at our pumping stations. You know, maybe there's things that we don't need and we don't need to put money into it. And then how do we maintain that sustainability? How can we look forward in time and project how the world's gonna change so we can be sustainable? So these are the key questions we're asking. These questions can be brought back to uh, the service level. Starting from the bottom, you know, at, at the very basic level, we want to know what level of service is attainable. You know, how many sewer backups is appropriate? How many complaints are appropriate? But in order to know that, we have to know our financial strategies. We have to know what kind of budgets we have to work with. Uh, in order to understand that, we have to know the budgeting process, the prioritization process. How do we shortlist projects? Then before that, we have to answer what are our life cycle needs? You know, how do we know if something needs to be replaced? How do we know what impact those have? 
we all have to know what value those assets have to the organization uh, community. What, how valuable is that arena to the public? How valuable is that road? You know, how many people drive on it? Uh, ultimately, what are owned? And at the very starting point, what are your objectives? So as you can see, the objectives of the town is really what drives everything that we do. If we can take the objectives, that's what's needed as a starting point to understand what kind of service we want to provide. So as you can see, this practice, it, there's really a lot of players at play. We have, we're looking at budgeting, we're looking at understanding maintenance needs, replacement needs, we're looking at understanding uh, you know, the needs in the future. You can imagine it's an undertaking that involves various parties, you know, public works, engineering, finance, everything that we do involves a multidisciplinary team. And this team is ultimately guided by the public engagement and input. So over time, we wanna understand what do people really value? And that's, that's part of the input that goes into setting your goals and targets. This involves setting processes, procedures, and practices. So what we want to do is we want to embed new processes into the town. Part of, part of that work of developing the new asset management plan and the program overall is, can we put different kinds of practices in play? You know, things like condition assessment programs, you know, prioritization processes, data governance procedures. You know, it, it's really at kind of that, that process level that we make that change. If we can get those processes together, that's when we start lowering our costs. And that's ultimately when we look at that balance of performance, cost, and risk. You saw there are many questions we have to, we have to answer in the previous slides. But once we can answer all those questions, then we have a clear picture of how we can find that right balance that, that fits the town of Aurora. Uh, so there are challenges though. And, and I often, you know, I get asked the question, you know, do an AMP in a month, two months, you know, why? the reason why things take time and the reason why it's a challenge is because of many factors, you know, primarily this is resource heavy. Uh, it's quite obvious you need a lot of data, but we also need to have processes embedded. This is very time consuming. You can imagine there's a lot of analysis that we need, uh, you know, to understand future costs, to understand risks, to understand at the basic level, what people even value. Doing this is quite complex. And, uh, and sadly enough, it's not just uh, something you do once. It's, it's really something that, that we have to do every year. And that's really why it's important to work at the process level of developing policies, procedures, and plans that once you have those pieces in place, you have a path forward. And it's, it's just about a small ongoing effort to maintain those systems and make small tweaks as needed. Benefits, uh, you know, some of them more obvious than others. It, it, it's about having good governance and increased accountability. If we make our decisions based on, on uh, objective facts, um, if we understand what the, what the true needs are, what the demands are, we're accountable. Our decisions are data-driven. They're not based on um, what was done in the past. It's, it's based on taking the data. It's about having enhanced sustainability of your infrastructure. If we have good condition assessment programs in place, as one example, we can understand maybe how those roads will deteriorate over time, and we can maybe know what kind of budget is needed to make them sustainable. If we have sustainable infrastructure, if we make good choices, we have a better quality of life. Uh, we can accurately forecast what's going to hit us. If we have models in place, if we know how our facilities deteriorate, if, if we know, you know what we're building in the future, we can forecast when these replacements come up and we can make sure we have a plan that's there when needed. And ultimately, you know, it's, it's part of it's that compliance with the federal and provincial regulations. So there's a lot of talk about the OREG, about these requirements for asset management plans. It's all really key, but that's just one of many benefits that we're doing. Um, 
for the remainder of today, I'll be going over the, the major elements of asset management. These are the elements that allows us to find the trade-offs of cost performance and risk. That first element is asset information. It, it's really the backbone of everything that we do. If we have good data, we have a good foundation for our decisions. If we know things like costs, condition, risk, needs, we can make better decisions. A lot of times you see decision errors from two factors. Either we don't have complete data or that data is misrepresented. So for example, if we don't have the, the, a true understanding of the condition of our facilities, we might not replace things on time or we might replace them too soon and spend too much money. That's one example. What we need to do is we need to define the data management processes and procedures. So that's some of the work that PSD is doing with the town is how we can have better data management. because This ultimately is what's used to build the asset management plan. The second element is our life cycle delivery. So over time, we have cost. It's not just about the cost of buying something now. You, you buy that new uh, pickup truck, fire truck. Um, there's a cost, but of course, over time, you're spending money year over year maintaining it. You're spending money on oil changes. Uh, over time, you might need to modify it. You might need to dispose it. Depending where you're disposing, you might have liabilities. Uh, part of the life cycle delivery is, is understanding the full life costs. If we understand the costs up front, it, it, it might change what we invest in. We might you know, invest in different kinds of vehicles. We might maintain things differently. But if we understand that, that full cost up front, we can make smarter decisions. And then also with that, we can look at the risk. What I'm showing here is a risk matrix. Um, you know, as we go to the top right, that's higher risk, bottom left is lower risk. Imagine that you can lay out everything that you own on this risk matrix. Right off the bat, you can see, well, we have close to $700,000 of very high risk assets. So that means we should have $700,000 available in case there's a huge failure we see that we have 7 million of very low risk. So this is saying that we have a lot of expenditure that is further in the future. And then of course, we have a mix of everything in the middle. So we can use that risk to help prioritize and, uh, and understand what kind of funds to set aside. The final element that ties us all together is the levels of service. You know, it, it, as I said, it's all about finding the balance between cost, performance, and risk. Imagine every year you can generate an image like this that shows these three factors. Every year you can look at, you know, what are we investing? Are we investing enough money? Um, you know, in this case, we're not. We're investing 2% and we should invest 4% as an example. This is not an example from Town of Aurora. This is an example for illustration purposes. But you can imagine this scenario, we're not investing enough. We still have decent performance and low risk, but that can change in the future. Every year we wanna be able to quantify these three things and imagine how much easier it is to make decisions if we, if we understand these different trade-offs. When we talk about levels of service, it's how we can use this information to find the different kinds of trade-offs so these are the, the major elements. I'll, I'll dig a little deeper into them. Um, the first one being that data collection. I wanna start off with by, by demonstrating the many objectives that, that staff of the town have to work with and the many different kinds of objectives that, that, that are required just, just for a, a functioning infrastructure base. At, at the very basic level, we have our financial reporting. So we, we have to be able to every year you know, report our tangible capital assets. We have to know book value. We have to know how things amortize. We have financial folks that are very good at this. But this is only one level. We also have people that, that are interested in how can we plan? How can we plan what new assets to buy? What new road networks to buy? If we have growth, how much more pressure do we need in our system? You can, you can imagine the amount of data that's needed for this. We have to understand growth rates. We have to understand uh, consumption rates, energy usage, land use. Taking it further, there are folks in operations that are interested in 
how can we maintain just what we own? You know, we want to be interested in the condition. We want to be interested in where things are located. We want to maybe have a work order system. So, so every time we get a service request, say to uh, patch a pothole, for example, or to service a, a pickup truck, we have a way to track that. And then all this goes into the asset management planning. So you can see you know, all these different objectives, we need to have the right kinds of information. So that information, we always start off with the data. We might have staff that go out and inspect a building. They might see defects. Based on those defects, it gives us information about condition. And then with that condition, we have knowledge about maybe it needs to be replaced now, maybe it's still in good condition, but, but that's where it all starts is the data. So our decision-making is only as strong as that data that, that it's relied upon. It's always tempting to do the reverse, to try and you know, guess the information and, uh, and take knowledge from that, but we need to have good data collection that's really where we build everything from. There's no point even talking about risk or life cycle or levels of service or anything else until we talk about data and make sure that's in a good state. We want to understand what kind of gaps we have in that data. So this is an exercise we usually do early on in the asset management program. This is just one example of what you can see for a water system. What I'm showing here are different types of data we might collect. So for example, we have historical cost in service state, useful life. These are things that tell us how much an asset costs. They're for financial reporting. We have other kinds of information too. So we might wanna know condition, material, pipe diameter. It, it, it's, uh, this list is not exhaustive, but you can see that the first step is looking at what data do we have and what do we need? This is a critical step that's often ignored. If we don't know our gaps, we can't make good decisions. But if we start here and fill in the gaps, that's when we start building our program. This is really defines our, our workload going forward. Um, this really defines what our true costs are, what our true needs are. So that gap analysis is, is really what that, that data piece is about, is, is can we understand what we need so we have that foundation? Um, and it, it, at this point, you may be thinking, well, it's, it's a Herculean task. We have, you know, uh, millions and millions of dollars worth of assets. We have kilometers of roads. We have facilities that are very complex. We have all these things. Uh, to start off with, uh, my recommendation is that we collect uh, what is meaningful and actionable. Um, you know, it's about doing that, that gap analysis and maybe we only collect data for the critical assets, things like pumping stations, like arterial roads, like emergency vehicles, emergency equipment. And then maybe we collect data for everything else. So it, it, we might make a work plan and, and understand what's important and start there. We also wanna look at defining a data governance policy or procedure. So that comes down to who owns the data. It, it comes down to you know, which department, which party is responsible for, for looking after it, who has what kind of access. Uh, and then lastly, we prioritize the efforts by criticality. So if we start anywhere, this is kind of where we start. Um, there's a lot more I can say about data, but I think you know, this is kind of uh, some of the key points, you know, doing that gap analysis and kind of working in a way that we can prioritize it. That's where I'd say we'd start. And that's, and that's really what um, takes a lot of time with, with staff and that's really a, a huge effort with the town. And that's really an effort that the town is, has taken and has gotten quite advanced in. Uh, the consequences, you know, if, if the town hadn't done that is quite obvious. We have poor decisions. We don't spend money properly. Um, it, we might not even know what to prioritize. So ultimately, you know, if we don't have that good data, that good inventory to work with, we have poor service, we have more costs, we have more risk. So 
So I, I think we've done, you know, a good job so far, but my point here is that we got to keep going away and we got to keep improving our data practices so that everything else we do is built on a strong foundation. So that's the data. Um, so levels of service. So as I mentioned, levels of service is about how can we balance cost performance and risk. Um, I just want to take a step back here and, and want to recognize that everything we do with the town is, has some value and provides some kind of service. So you can imagine you wake up in the morning, you brew your cup of coffee, that right there requires pipes to provide clean drinking water. Uh, maybe pre-COVID times you would have driven to work, you need a road to drive on. Um, maybe we need emergency vehicles because there's a fire somewhere. Perhaps you have, uh, you know, children that you take to, you know, the arena to play hockey. All these things provide service. And that value is about, you know, what, what we're doing is about trying to quantify that value. We're not getting caught up in, in, you know, what is the asset? We need to replace it. We want to start off with, you know, what services do we provide? And we work from there. Uh, we saw this earlier. You know, again, that that service, understanding the use of that water pipe, the you know, being able to drive to work, all these things at the end of the day are what's rolled into that levels of service framework. So when we always start at a high level, we start at you know understanding these three key indicators. And then we might start looking at tracking specific metrics. Okay, so value, where do we start? Well, it, it doesn't matter what kind of service, what kind of asset, what kind of piece of infrastructure. It, it, there's really core public values across across the whole town. Um, you know, across, uh, I almost say humanity, it's, it's people are interested in having services that are acceptable or accessible. Are they there when you need it? If, if you need your cup of coffee in the morning, do you have, you know, water pressure? Are services reliable? How long is your road closures? Can you rely that when you need the road to get to work, you can get to work? Are they safe? Meeting regulation, um, even affordable, and affordability is on two ends. It's affordability of the public to use a service, you know, what are the taxes and rates, but also it's affordability of the town, um, you know, to be able to maintain everything. And lastly, public always value what's sustainable. They want to know that the services they have today will keep being provided in the future. When you, when you talk about values, it, it's about looking at these core values. And from here is where we can start tracking and understanding truly what we're providing. Part of this, part of the value is understanding that value, the, the, the value changes across communities. And, and this is simply because we have different kinds of trends, different kinds of things influencing us. So this is just a list of some of the things that influence service delivery. We need to recommend, we need to um, recognize that the natural environment. So maybe we have, you know, flooding some years. Um, Maybe with, with more extreme weather events, we need to expand the capacity of our stormwater network. We have trends around aging infrastructure. You know, we saw earlier, you know, a lot of assets across Canada are getting quite old. But another interesting one is demographics. Uh, maybe what we're seeing is that we're having a lot of people moving out of more urban areas, um, you know, into the town. And when we have different kinds of people moving in, they bring in their expectations. Because maybe in a larger urban setting like City of Toronto, they're used to, um, you know, different kinds of, uh, you know, sports programs available. They're interested in in different kinds of service delivery um, that maybe is brought upon the town. You have, you know, constraints of the fiscal capacity, uh, your own expertise, um, and even COVID in recent years. So we all saw that with COVID, you know, the price of different things like lumber, metal, all these things have gone up. Uh, and, and what I want to get away from with this here is that when we talk about value and when we talk about the commitments for the town, 
we need to recognize that the town has unique commitments and we wanna be able to, to quantify and factor in these different kinds of influencers because what's reasonable for, for one community might not be for Aurora. So can we quantify these influencers so, so we know what's a, a realistic target to hit? So um, we started off with, with kind of balancing the cost, performance, and risk. We recognize we have influencers. We recognize we work within constraints. And now we can start tracking data to see where we're getting. Um, when we track levels of service, we want to track it at two different levels. We want to track at the community level. That's what the customer sees or experiences and the technical level. So you can imagine you drive down the road, you ride over a pothole, you get a flat tire. You know, that's a customer experience. You get a complaint. These are things you can track. Um, but what we can do is we can take that with a lens at a more operational or asset level. Do we get that pothole because we have a lot of roads in poor condition? Or maybe we got that pothole because our, our crack sealing program has slowed down. Um, we might see a different kind of story. Maybe we're increasing the amount of roads we're applying crack sealing on, um, but we're still getting potholes. If we collect the right kinds of service metrics uh, over time, that's what can really tell us if we're delivering on what we should be delivering on. If we have, and this really takes a lot of data. If we have the right kind of data, we can demonstrate this. And lastly, how can we operationalize all of this? How can we quantify the trade-off between cost performance and risk? How can we track metrics? Um, it, it, it's always about developing a process to review and refine. So we start very basic. Maybe all we do is we track cost performance and risk and a few mandated metrics, but maybe year over year, we, we add to the mix. We find out what's, what we're interested in, in, in measuring. Over time, maybe by the time it's 2025, we start tracking targets. We know what kind of influencers we have. We know what kind of expectations we have so we can set reasonable targets. And then what we do is we look at what's the gap between the, the, the target levels of service and the current levels of service. Um, for example, if we're getting more complaints than we thought was necessary, maybe that will mean we need to take different kinds of actions. So we need to look at closing those gaps. And that's really what levels of service does is it, it tells us how well we're performing. And if we know our target, it, it's simple as, as trying to close those gaps. To so start very high level, as I said, you know, the cost performance risk. Uh, and over time, we can look at collecting uh, more kinds of information. And, and these metrics should always be tracked on an annual basis. So you can see that, say, five years from now, you can see a trend. You know, we're, we're spending more money in operations and maintenance. You know, maybe that's a bad thing. Um, or maybe it's a good thing because we see we're getting less complaints. Um, if, if we don't know those trends over time, we can't really tell the full story. We don't know what's working. It, it's one thing to cite how much money we're spending on maintenance or capital. But it's another thing to be able to justify that by saying that we're doing a better job because there's less safety incidents, there's more satisfaction. So it's important that we can track it over time so that we can have, you know, a good understanding of, 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 um, of how acceptable we are and if we need to improve. So that covers levels of service. So that, that's what kind of brings everything together. Um, to understand, you know, part of that. So first off, we're going to start off with the performance piece. You know, remember we're balancing three things. One of them is performance. Condition is the most basic measurement of that performance. All we're doing is we're taking observations over time and mapping them. So a road over time will have different kinds of defects. There's methodologies out there that the town of Aurora is very familiar with. And with these, with these criteria, we can say how oh, soon that road's gonna fail. Same thing for a pump. We might identify different things like oil loss, noise, heat, and uh, you know that might give us a good sense of when that might fail. 
it, it's important here that we were able to to not just rely on age, but that we're able to try and map these, these observations over time for good condition. What I'm showing here is a study by AMO. Um, they looked at three different kinds of assets, roads, culverts, and bridges. What we're showing here in the black are results of assessed conditions. So that's if you have people going out, looking at the cracks in the road and understanding condition versus the gray, which is age-based. Uh, interestingly enough, if we just rely on age-based, things are in poorer condition than they should be. If we assess that road, it might be in kind of that good to fair condition, whereas age is saying that it's poor. So what happens if we just rely on age, we might be spending more money than we need to. That's why it's really important to have a good condition assessment program together so that we, we, we understand the true condition of that asset and we can make interventions on time. I won't go into the nitty gritty of, of the full um, you know, program, but at a high level, when we're collecting condition, there's, there's, a, there's some considerations that, that staff um, look at, um, and these different considerations are what, bring, are what puts together our condition assessment program. So we look at you know, what kinds of data we capture. It, it, it's often a mix of internal, work, so staff doing road patrols, health and safety checks, but also some more, you know, external work, like, like hiring a consultant or contractor to do a code and condition study. We look at doing these things at different timings. Um, you know, maybe we go out for a road patrol daily or weekly, but maybe we do that road need study every five years. Maybe we do different studies based on diagnostics. You know, maybe we see we have um, high energy usage, so maybe that warrants us to look at what's going on. Maybe for vehicles at specific mileage points, we inspect. The key point here is that that we, we, we pick the right intervals to assess what we own so that we can have condition, you know, at, at, at when we need it. And of course, with condition, we might need to look at energy audits, capacity information, key performance indicators. Um, there's really a lot that goes into that data collection program, but where we start is we start at looking at what data are we gonna capture and, and what kind of cycle are we gonna do that? Um, a simple way we can do this is by defining a grading scale. So this is an example for, for a facility, for a piece of that facility, the, you know, the superstructure and substructure. We want to have consistency. Part of asset management is, is, as I said, putting together processes and procedures. So maybe we have a procedure around assessment. Maybe we have a set of criteria that tells us what is good condition, what is fair condition, what is poor condition. You can imagine if we have different assessors going out at different times, we have consistency because they all look at the same kind of criteria. When, when we have a good condition scale, you know, we, we really have those, those accurate condition scores. Um, and really this is, you know, one of the, the starting places of a condition assessment program is, is, is how can we develop scales to accurately assess what we own. Um, so that covers condition, the first major pillar of levels of service. So, you know, in summary, it's all about, you know, having good data at the right intervals. It's all about being able to, to, to understand the defects we see to identify a condition score. The second piece here is the risk. Um, so risk management, the Ontario regulation 58817, it requires a high level documentation. So that's, you know, the corporate risks. Um, you know, the risk of undertaking your current kind of maintenance and replacement strategy. Um, but a better approach and the approach that we're taking with the town is looking at, you know, what are probability and consequence of failure. So instead of just looking at what are the, the high level risks, what are, you know, do we have a risk with uh, extreme weather? Instead, we can say, you know, what are the ri risk level of specific assets? That's ultimately where we want to go. And in best practice, you know, in the ISO 31,000, it's about quantifying the uncertainty on achieving your objectives. So, you know, again, this goes back to levels of service. We have objectives about providing the right kind of service. 
what things bring uncertainty. Uh, we can quantify that uncertainty. Really, really two, two things we're looking at. What's the probability of failure and what's the consequence? Uh, it's not just looking at the worst road or the worst vehicle. It's about looking at maybe which one provides the most value. Maybe that's, that's a good consideration. And maybe you marry that consideration of value with, with probability. So as we saw earlier, you get that condition assessment program together. You understand how soon things might fail. And now we start looking at quantifying the other half, which are the consequences. We can do that and we can build a matrix. Um, and we can identify strategies at different parts of that matrix. Um, so this is what I showed earlier in the elements, is that we take the information, the probability and the consequence. So you can see probability of left to right as things get closer to failure, we're getting to the right. And as things get much more critical or severe, or more important, we go to the top. So this, this is looking at two dimensions. And, and that's really how we should prioritize by looking at those two different dimensions. So, I mean, this is just one way to visualize risk. Why I like it is that you can see, you know, how many assets are in different categories, how much money is in different categories. And at an initial glance, you can see kind of what money is needed upfront and maybe what is needed more long-term. Uh, at an operational level, we can identify strategies by where things fall in risk. So those very high risk are quite obvious. We might just replace them because they're, they're near the end of their life and they're important. But where it gets interesting is maybe where we fall somewhere in the middle. So that's the top left and the bottom right. You know, they're a little different. If we're in the bottom right, those are the assets that are close to failure, but not too significant. So maybe they're things like small diameter water mains, pickup trucks, maybe they're near the end of their life, but you know that it's it's better just to replace them when they fail um, because when they fail, it's not too significant. So maybe for these ones, you have a monitoring program and you just try and predict when they fail so you have the money ready. But maybe we have kind of the opposite, the bottom, the top left where we have the very high consequence but low probability. Maybe these are your very large diameter water mains, um, emergency equipment. Maybe these are things that either cost a lot or have health and safety impacts. They're still fairly new, but because they're so important or expensive, we want to make sure we have preventative maintenance programs together. Um, you know, for example, this is maybe where we do the crack sealing on important roads, um, servicing important equipment. And then the bottom left, that, that's just routine monitoring because these are things that aren't too significant and are still fairly new. So, you know, just at a high level to take a step back, it, it, it's all about using risk so that we can slot the work where it's needed. Risk is, is, is all about where we put our efforts. And this is a simple way of visualizing it, is if we can quantify risk for everything, we can, we can know what kind of efforts go where. Um, so that's, that's kind of risk in a nutshell. It, it's, as I said, it's about looking at two factors, the probability and consequence. And then, it's, and then once we have that defined, we can slot in the right strategies in the right places. You know, this takes, you know, a lot of data to have, you know, the, the right kind of information to build a risk model. It takes time to uh, verify and validate that risk model. But you can see if you have it in place, it, it can help you um, prioritize and make sure you, you spend the money in the right places. So where do we start? You know, it, it, we want to start at identifying data we have that can be leveraged. Maybe we have a road need study. We have traffic counts, you know, because traffic counts are important. You want to know the roads that are driven on the most. Maybe we have some condition data. We use what we have. And then over time, we spend efforts on closing some data gaps and bringing in other kinds of data that's important for risk. It might be expanding your condition assessment program so you can better understand the likelihood of failure. Maybe it's undertaking, um, uh, maybe it's about um, 
doing capacity analysis to know, you know, which sewer mains are, are um, provide the most uh, flow. So it, it's about understanding what are other kinds of data we can bring in. Once we have that risk model, we want to think about what kind of appetite do we have for risk? You know, what kind of risk is, is acceptable? Because there's never zero risk. Um, and as you saw earlier, it, it costs money to uh, mitigate risk. Everything's always about a balance, but we can maybe think about what kind of risk appetite we have. And then what we do is you measure that risk and we put together programs uh, to mitigate that risk long-term. And the last part of all this is the cost. So we're balancing three things. We said we can understand condition as one form of performance. We said that we can then understand risk, you know, and then now we're looking at the life cycle, which is the full cost, which is what we talked about earlier, that costs that accrue through the full life. And when I say cost for balancing, it, it's what May said earlier too, it's the, the operations, the capital, it's everything. Um, and understanding this um, is, is definitely a complex task because we have different parties involved at different times. You know, we have capital projects, we have operations. Um, it's about being able to plan in the future, being able to understand how, how assets deteriorate so we know when the spending comes. Um, and that's what we're doing with life cycle planning is, is, is really looking at what are the full life costs and when do they happen? And if we can understand that, we can take it a step further and optimize our spending. This is a simple example. Um, you know, this applies you know, to roads, to bridges, um, sewer mains. These things often are, are cheap to maintain early on. You can imagine you spend a dollar per unit early on, something like a crack sealing program some kind of simple maintenance, the oil changes, instead of waiting for it to fail and spending six to 10 times that amount on, on reconstruction. So of course, this curve here that I'm showing is different you know, for different kinds of assets, but the core principle is that if, if we know um, the life cycle costs at different times and we know how an asset deteriorates, we can look at spending the money at the right time. I won't go into too much detail on um, you know, all of the, the nuances of life cycle, but I, th I think an important takeaway on top of that is that we bucket activities in different ways and we wanna use these different buckets strategically. So early on in, in the life of, of a road, of a building, that's where we have a lot of the operations. That's where we do the monitoring, uh, patching if it's a road. Um, maybe it's putting a coating um, on a, a steel member if it's a facility. Some preventative maintenance where it, it's the kind of maintenance that adds life. And then as you move to the right, you see the condition is going down and the asset's getting older. That's when we, we get together a capital program. We reline, we resurface, we refurbish. Um, if it's a road, it could be, you know, a single lift, a double lift, you know, there's different kinds of rehabilitation and then we replace. So that's the natural progression. We see that almost all the time. Um, but the thing here is that we might not need to do all these activities for everything. If we have that good risk model, if we, if we know what's really important, what's really critical, we can say, okay, those roads with a lot of traffic, that's where we have a very refined program that's very proactive. And those ones that don't, maybe we do more of the bare minimum. Um, it, it's about being strategic. It's about having the data to show that we're, we're doing the things at the right time. Um, you know, this is just, just one way we can visualize it. This is, you know, an, an example that I see many times over is that, you know, what we do a lot of times is we compare a replacement only strategy to a more proactive strategy where we have things like maintenance and rehabilitation. And what I'm plotting here is, is you know, one example um, showing costs over time. And, you know, as you might guess, 
the replacement only strategy in the blue is more than the life cycle strategy. Of course, you wouldn't know this up front, but this is where it's important to have good data. And this is, you know, what the town is kind of moving towards. This is what the asset management plan uh, could show at some point with that life cycle analysis. We can demonstrate that if we do the right things, we can avoid costs. We can justify being proactive because over time we save money. Um, you know, all this comes from, as I said, having that good data so we can build models and that we can project and that we can know um, what kind of costs we're expecting. And maybe with this, we might see, okay, maybe a budget reallocation could be justified. Maybe we can put together um, you know, a, a relining program network-wide because we found out that that works based on our records. It, it, it might mean shifting money in different pockets because we're being strategic about how we spend that. So that's really the long-term goal of life cycle is, is, is about being strategic. So benefits, uh, it, it's, it's again, as I said, you're being more proactive. You're maximizing the service life. So things last longer. You don't get as many complaints because you know, the equipment is in good working order. Um, you're lowering cost because we're spending money strategically. And ultimately, if we have a good life cycle program, we have an improved levels of service. You know, we are hitting on one of these pillars. Um, you know, having a good life cycle program, we reduce the cost. So if we have more money available, maybe that means we reduce also the risk and improve the performance. So it, it's really key that we think long term um, and that we use a life cycle program to maximize the service we're providing. Um, I only have about uh, probably 10 more minutes, so um, I'll, I'll continue. Um, so the last part of today, you know, we went over, you know, some case studies uh, may, you know, talked about how important, you know, what the, what the shape of the town is. And now we talked about, you know, strategies to go forward. The last thing I want to touch on is just, um, the asset management plan and what's going on with it going forward. Uh, just, I want to take, you know, five to 10 minutes here to go over the, the asset management plan. You know, we're taking all these different elements, like the condition, the life cycle, the risk, and, and we're organizing these in sections. So we want, want to understand the state of the infrastructure. What's the condition? What's the cost? Our asset management strategies. How are we being strategic with our spending? And then the financial strategy. So what's going to be the cost long term? The AMP, Asset Management Plan, is, is, is a kind of a long term plan. It looks at, you know, what is the levels of service going to be in the next 10 years? What are things going to cost in the next 10 to 20 years? It's a very tactical document because it speaks to the current state of our assets and it lets us know how our services and costs will be impacted based on how we're operating. Again, it should involve you know, everyone in the town, you know, finance, public works, you know, other departments, and it should align with our capital planning. An example of some of the sections. So what, what we will be looking at doing with, with our undertaking is, is updating that inventory analysis. You know, this is um, an example. This is not the town of Aurora, but you can imagine what we're doing is we're, we're looking at, can we break down these different kinds of assets, understand the costs, even understand where those costs come from, you know, inflation versus user defined costs. And then we can get a summary of the costs. Uh, similarly, we want to look at the remaining useful life. So we want to know how much life is left. So we can we need to break down our assets. And if we have a good condition assessment programs, if we have good data, we can better understand how much life is left of, of everything that we own. And the condition, of course, too. So we want to show the current condition. That's another requirement of the state of the infrastructure is that we, we document the condition. It, if we only have age-based data, that's fine. We can use age-based. But as I said, it's always better to use assess because it's much more accurate. 
And then lastly, the replacement requirements. So we take all this good hard work, we take this work of, of identifying data gaps, of setting good strategies, of knowing when things will deteriorate. We put all this together and then we can see long-term what we're spending, you know, what we're spending over, you know, at least 20 years, possibly even 50 years. And, and this, you know, gives us a good sense of what's going to come up. Um, and of course, the numbers that we see will change depending on the data. But the important part here is that our undertaking now, we're going to look at using better data so that we can have a more accurate forecast. The financial strategy takes everything we put together and, and lets us know what are the financial requirements based on our life cycle interventions, based on our priorities. Um, you know, what it'll analyze our, our, our financial capacity, what kind of funding streams we have. We can even look at different kinds of scenarios, maybe taking on different kinds of rates, trying to close the gap in different numbers of years. Um, so that, that financial strategy is what, what looks at different things we can do. And this is, you know, the recommendations that go to council is that the, the asset management plan will give you an array of different strategies and different outcomes based on those strategies. And then those are recommendations, you know, that, that council can look at uh, for decision-making. And this will also allow you to compare to other municipalities nearby. So what are the next steps? So the next steps here um, really is, is understanding, you know, asset management, understanding before we, we get to the AMP, um, before we, we understand scenarios, it's about understanding, you know, just what that levels of service is for the town. And then we look at trying to optimize based on the, the levels of service we want. And then we can look at forecasting the long-term needs. So approving the AMP, the asset management plan and the program of a whole is the key to success. If you have a good program together, if you can collect good data, if you have good procedures, if, if you can be strategic about planning, that's very important. And I, th I think it's important that we, we keep those, those programs together. I think it's also important that we consider data-driven decisions because um, when we have data, we can understand trade-offs at, at a data level, at, at, at something that's objective. And also the, the, you know, the town and council, we, we should also look at um, possibly some public engagement, um, you know, at some point in time, definitely for the 2025 requirements, we have to set goals and targets. So at some point in time, it might be engaging the public just to understand what their relative priorities are, uh, understanding that you know everything that we own really goes to serve the residents and stakeholders. So we need to have a way to, to track their expectations. And again, th this is more long-term, but this is something that we have to look at at some point. So those really are kind of the, the steps we're gonna take now um, to, to advance that program. So that brings it um, to the end, end of our presentation. Um, so I'll bring it to you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, for the questions. So um, does everyone want to just go into questions or does everyone want to take a, maybe a, a five, 10 minute break because otherwise we'll start the questions. We will have to take our, our health break at nine o'clock regardless. So do you want to just do that now? Is everyone good with that? We'll do that now and then we'll come back and we'll do, we'll each have uh, at least uh, two times to speak. So, and ask questions, okay? okay. So we'll take our 10 minute uh, health break at this point and then we'll come back. Thank you, Jordan. So we'll come back, we'll just take a break and come back and we'll ask some questions. Okay, so see you all at 8.55.
All right, council, we're back. Are there any questions? Councilor Gilliam. Thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, the presenters. Thank you so much for this uh, amazing uh, workshop. I have to say this is probably the best workshop that I think I've <laughs> attended since I started. Um, I'm glad this is being recorded because this will move on for our other generations of councillors. Great, great um, asset management plan report and assessment. I just kind of wanted to throw that out there. Um, there were some slides that were showing earlier about an assessment um, rating is from A, B, C, D, E. And um, just a quick question. I noticed that in one of the slides, the residential water meters was rated E. And I don't know if this was just an example or this was actually a rating based on where we lie as far as our ratings. And I was just curious as to, um, cause I think it's a 2018. So is this something um, that was rated because it was based on 2018 and we hadn't replaced all the meters. Cause I thought we we're kind of like uh, moving forward quickly with a lot of this replacement. Could you just uh, maybe um, Ms. Wainwright Van Kessel kind of touch on that? Ms. Wainwright Van Kessel. For you, Mr. Mayor. So the piece that relates to the 2018 plan is yes, it's from our 2018 assessment that was in our, pre our current AMP. But as you know, we do have a water meter replacement program in place. So we have been replacing a number of meters on an annual basis. So um, I'm sure with all the activity that has happened um, over the last few years, when we reassess that through this asset management planning, uh, that grade will actually increase. No, sir. Great, perfect. It's what, exactly what I thought. Um, another um, comment slash question. Um, I, I, I love the whole, um, you know, assessment versus age and um, consequence versus probability. There's so much to consider when we're collecting this data. So I guess my question is, it all really comes down to the quality of data, which is, I think we learned kind of uh, loud and clear. And, but we never really talked about, um, you know, how are we gonna um, collect that data and um, the quality of that data really is gonna dictate how great this assessment is gonna really, you know, form and mold our decision making. Is there some sort of um, plan in place for that that's already st starting or changing or moving to kind of create those specific buckets that the consultant was talking about earlier? Ms. Wainwright of Hankessel? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to defer this question to Mr. Gartner. Okay. Mr. Gartner? Yes, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, we, we do have a plan to get there. Uh, as uh, May and Jordan alluded to, our, our starting point is identifying uh, how we want to measure uh, the performance of our assets. Uh, so the one, one key output that's gonna come from this review is, is the identification of what measures we'd like to use to, to measure our, our levels of service. Uh, obviously the next important step is gonna be that gap analysis in terms of what data we need to collect in order to, to measure that. Uh, and, and of course, the identification of what our desired level of performance should be. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, uh, Councillor, that's our goal is to get to that point. First step is identifying a measure. Councillor? Thank you. I appreciate that. And when you say identifying the measure, um, I'm assuming when we're talking kind of when they were specifically talking about certain activities, and I think the quote was, um, buckets of activities in different ways. We want to be strategic on what those buckets look like. And I guess my questions were, you know, some of that can be subjective, that quantifying risk and what that means. And um, do we have like a starting point for that model? Right. Do you want to tackle that one or? Well, uh, th through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we, we are receiving some guidance from, from our, our consultants as to what uh, a good measure should be. And certainly the part of the, part of the, the goal there is to minimize the subjective uh, assessments that are necessary. They're, not, they're unavoidable in some instances, but I, I think our consultant will help us in defining those measures. 
uh, based upon what others are doing and what, what is a realistic approach to take. Councillor? Thank you. So there's obviously is some great work to be done here. Um, consultants have done a great job. Uh, I'm, I love the fact that we are on the right track. Uh, I can already see how we'll be utilizing this uh, assessment in our next upcoming budget and how it'll help us guide and make those decisions. So um, collecting that data is going to be key and what do we what we do with it. And also looking at the overall view of just operationally, um, I, I think I think there was a comment made. It's like it may look like a good idea now and we have the capital, but if we don't have the operational risks and the forecast down the road, it may not be the best result. So I do appreciate all the assessment that um, the, the consultant brought forward. And I look forward to um, the, the, the kind of modeling that comes forward and what we see at the next budget. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Um, through you to uh, uh, Jordan and, and my, who, who unfortunately had to leave. You know, certainly thank you for a very uh, thorough and, and detailed overview of asset management. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be in on council uh, a few terms now, and um, we've uh, you know talked about this for many years and, and gone through some of this. Uh, I'm going to assume that you're you're familiar with the 2018 asset management plan. You know, I, I had a chance to uh, read through it in advance of this uh, this meeting tonight, and just. You know, there are many similarities in terms of what was identified tonight as well as what's in our 2018 plan. And so my question really through you to uh, Jordan is in terms of strategies, you know, certainly understand the idea that, you know, better data means better decisions and it's good to always update that plan and try and acquire more data. But in terms of the strategies that will be proposed in the, the future asset management plan compared to the 2018 plan, is there anything really that you didn't see in the 2018 in terms of an alternative strategy or a newer strategy that you know I think would be important to bring to uh, to light and, and to discuss for this council to be able to better manage our assets? Jordan, through you, Mr. Mayor. I I'd say one of the um, and I see this gap a lot with kind of the older iterations of the asset management plans is that there's a lot of assumptions around kind of a replacement only strategy. So you understand how long your roads will last, your vehicles will last, replace them with their, when they're at the end of their life. But I think a strength with, with a newer iteration is that for some of the more significant assets, like the roads, we can look at, you know, what is, how can we factor in those life cycle strategies to have a more, accurate, truer forecast of those costs. I see that as kind of a big win. And then also just, as you said, updating the data. I think a lot of times, you know, replacement costs are, are a gap. So it's, everyone has costs around, you know, what do we historically spend to buy something? But it's, it's, it's always a, a challenge to get what are the true current day costs. So I think if we get those true current day costs, you know, that'll, that'll change. Um, yeah, I mean, really just from a strategic level, a lot of it is just factoring in that, that life cycle. And I, I think that'll make a big difference. Councillor? Thank you. I certainly believe with that philosophy of, you know, what gets measured gets managed. And so better data does make for better decisions. Um, not so much a question, but really just, I guess, maybe a comment and maybe there's a question in there, but just going back to one of the earlier slides that, uh, about putting Canadian context on it. And she said that 60% of all infrastructure is owned by municipalities. And that certainly has been um, a number thrown out by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, FCM, as well as the Association of Municipalities in, in Ontario, AMO. And they talk a lot about the fact that there is a significant infrastructure deficit or gap when it comes to municipalities. The fact that we own 60% of the infrastructure or assets, but yet only get 10 cents of every uh, tax dollar with the other 90 cents going to the province and federal, shows that it is a Herculean task to try and um, you know, catch up when it comes to the infrastructure. In fact, the last report I saw from FCM, I think it pegged the, uh, the deficit growing at nearly $2 billion a year for municipalities as they try to catch up. And so, you know, certainly, I, I certainly, you know, are fully supportive of the municipality doing everything it can to better manage its assets, plan for the repair, the replacement, and the 
um, you know, growth of the municipality, but at the same time, you know, the message needs to continue to go to the higher levels of government that we can't do it alone. We definitely need continued financial support to be able to do this because 10 cents on the dollar is not gonna replace all 60% of those assets. So, you know, I don't wanna drive Jordan into that conversation, but I certainly know that uh, my colleagues who have gone to FCM and AMO, they've heard them talk many times that uh, that infrastructure gap is growing and more needs to be done because, you know, certainly there are many municipalities that are not as fortunate as us when it comes to, uh, you know, tax base and other avenues of growth. And they are struggling tremendously to replace their assets. I think, you know, we've, we've heard from some in the past that, you know, have uh, wharfs and other significant infrastructure that for a small town, there's just no way they can replace it. So that's it. I, I certainly appreciate the presentation. You know, some of it I've, I've heard before and certainly look forward to seeing the report and the data that comes out of it so that when it comes to budget time, we can make those decisions around repair and replacement of our assets and service levels. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Gallo. Thank you and thank you for the presentation and, and the detail that, that's in it. Um, I, I really enjoyed it and, and I, I echo Councillor Thompson's view on you know, that, that subject, um, just listening to this and, and understanding a bit and, you know, the, it's very easy for the province to put in regulations for us to, to do and achieve goals and all of that, um, yet, you know, the funding just simply isn't there. And, and, and I, I agree, it's, it's a significant uh, problem. Um, in terms of, of I fully agree in, you know, collecting the data and making sure the data is accurate is, is obviously a, a huge key in this uh, success. Um, on, on the service level side, uh, page 64 of 95 operating levels of service. The second point, uh, develop a process to re, uh, review framework and refine as necessary uh, annual performance review process. And the next point, take your time to measure current levels of service before setting your targets, uh, review KPIs to ensure that data is meaningful, accurate, and, and reliable. Um, to me, that's pretty significant. Um, not only taking our time to review the current service levels, but at the end of the, the, the presentation, it also speaks to public engagement. Uh, and I'm struggling a little bit with that because I, I agree with it, uh, but uh, I don't know how we achieve that on this subject matter. Uh, to me, it sounds very difficult. I think we should be doing it. And I think we should be gauging the public, but in a meaningful way. And I'm wondering um, through other uh, consultants, Jordan or Ms. William Van Kessel, in, in your experience, uh, how has the public been engaged in service level review of capital assets? How successful have other municipalities been in, in, in engaging the public? Sure. Yeah, through Mr. Mayor, um, I'll I'll maybe start this off. Um, I, I'd say that the biggest consideration is is can you link it back to something that the residents value? So a lot of times, you know, there's different media, of course, to do this. So a lot of times it could be a survey, and what you might do is you might link um, service levels back to what could be, you know. Uh, cost per household or how much of an increase in their water bill, um, things that really relate back um, to the residents and also um, understanding their priorities. It, it's, it's about presenting data in a way that, that is, is meaningful to them. Don't just say, you know, we're, what do you think of spending $5 million to rehabilitate this road? It could be, you know, how would you feel about having a, a tax increase of X so that it, this road is smooth? So, I mean, it's, what I wanna say is it's not so much in, in the media, like survey versus whatever, but it's, it's about framing the question that's meaningful. And that's what I found has generally been successful. No, sir. Thank you, and to you, Mr. Mayor, I guess to, Ms. Wainwright, Van Kessel, or whomever. So what is our strategy in terms of um, engaging the public? It does say on page 91, the next steps, the last point, 
uh, council and staff, it says should hold public engagement opportunities to understand the priorities um, and levels of service expectations of, of residents. Uh, although I don't see on the last page, 95, uh, the next steps in terms of the dates, July 7th presentation, and second gen uh, a &P committee and the other dates, none of them speak to public engagement. Ms. Mary Van Kessel. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So as we know, um, working with the public, particularly on some of these matters is fairly challenging as uh, getting their feedback can be challenging at times. So Part of this in this asset management journey is there are a number of different uh, regulations that we need to meet over the next few years. And as we get towards those ones that are required for 2025, that's where some of that public engagement is really required to uh, meet the regulations that the province has put in place to be able to develop, further develop the asset management plan. So during that time, we can look at building on other things such as community survey and other actions the town is taking holding public um, sessions. But again, it's, it's getting that feedback is what's challenging at times as we have to make sure that we put things in terms that the public understands, as Jordan mentioned. So this is discussion at budget, this is discussion on social media and some public events. But as we go forward, we need to translate that into what those levels of service and how much each those service levels cost. That was it. So through you, Mr. Mayor, so before July 14th, council approval of the second generation AMP, we are not engaging the public. Ms. Maria Van Kessel. Through you, Mr. Mayor, so at this point, we are not engaging, but we are engaging as part of the regulations required for 2025. No, sir. And, and so that second generation, what would... Would that document um, be a result of everything we've discussed tonight, gathering the data, doing all that, um, assessing service levels, uh, all of that? Is that the completed document or it's a step in the process? Ms. Mayor Kessel? Through you, Mr. Mayor, so th this is a step in the process to getting to that final plan that we'd have by 2025. So this is part of the journey for asset management. It's not all going to be complete on July 7th. It's part of the way that we do get there and it will evolve over time as well. Yes, sir. So if the intent is to engage the public somewhere between now and July 1st, 2025, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm interested in seeing what comes up July 7th or July 14th when we approve it um, and how detailed that document is uh, before any public engagement and how flexible are we going to be to change that document um, once we do engage the public in terms of service levels and, and I don't know how detailed that document is going to be. Um, obviously, my hope is that before uh, July 2025, We've engaged the public to a significant degree and we're not moving the, the ball too far forward uh, to this summer so that the public does have an opinion and, and can affect the results of, of our asset management plan. Is that is that fair to say through you, Mr. Mayor? Ms. Mary Van Kessel? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So as part of this process, the big piece is establishing what we're going to measure. And then as we evolve through to 2025 is established, finally establishing what the different impacts of different service levels are. So we're not locked in as of July 7th, we do have that ability to adapt based on um, the levels of service expected by our community and also from our financial implications of those levels of service as well. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll look forward to that document and uh, review it in detail, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Jordan, for the, uh, the detailed presentation. And I have to say that's one of the more detailed presentations I've ever witnessed. And I'm not sure if I can remember all of them, but I think the one takeaway uh, that drives 
that this presentation drives home is that asset management is important. Um, a second takeaway take I had is, is that you differentiated between linear and non-linear assets. And it seems that the, the most, uh, uh, the significant challenges that asset managements uh, have is the uh, non-linear uh, part of the portfolio. And that includes, uh, I think it was mentioned, stormwater, uh, wastewater, uh, buildings and fleet. You know, it'd be easy to have you know one coefficient or multiplier be you know before an equation, and we just apply that, and we can handle the rest. But how do we handle uh, as a municipality um, with the scarce resources we have? What's the most optimal way to handle the nonlinear ass assets? Because, uh, as you stated, um, the you know nonlinear assets like uh, stormwater. Uh, and sewage, you know, you, we can't go in there and visually see what's going on. Uh, fleet, you know, we can have, you know, because it's used every day, it's a more easier nonlinear asset to kind of quantify in terms of depreciation and replacement value. So is there optimal formula to deal with nonlinear assets? Because sometimes even checking up on a nonlinear assets is almost as expensive as replacing the asset itself. So how do we go about making that decision uh, in that part of the asset portfolio? Jordan? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, no, uh, very good question. Um, there, there are significant challenges. And as you said, it costs money to collect data and it's hard to know what's important, but there's not one uh, optim there's not one equation, but I, the principle that works is being able to prioritize. So it's all about, you know, what are the things that cost the most, serve the most people, maybe have environmental impacts. If we can understand kind of what's the most, most critical, highest risk, that's where we start. And, and, and you know, it, 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 it's recognizing you'll never, you, you won't have enough money to fix everything right now. So it's starting at what's most important and that's where the risk comes in and, you know, kind of, working from there. Yes, sir. Thank you. And I think that's the biggest challenge that we have is that the assets that we don't see, you know, you, you know that, that might have a shelf life of 30 years and it breaks down in 10, 15 years. And we don't, and someone recommends that we check it for X million dollars and we choose not to because it hasn't reached close to its shelf life. Uh, you know, and you, you get, uh, those pundits giving you and I told you so. So I think that's the biggest challenge is, you know, how do we, you know, how do we uh, best manage, you know, the uh, the budgetary assets that we have, um, and, and that's where you know we look to you know consultants like yourself to kind of help us to prioritize and um, give us kind of that roadmap so that we can say, hey, you know, we're following this roadmap here, and it's not always going to be correct, but you know, this is all we have to go by. Um, so that's what really stuck out to me. Um, and there was another slide. Uh, there's a whole bunch of questions, but it was just too detailed. But I'll, my, my last question is, uh, there was a slide on renewal requirements and it said um, it delays replacement. So are you saying that renewal requirements uh, or renewing is a detriment to um, asset management, it's better to replace as opposed to renew? Jordan? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it, it all comes down to the asset. It all comes down to the cost. Generally, more significant or expensive assets like pumps, large diameter water mains, um, heavy machinery, those things, it, it could pay off um, to renew instead of replace. But those other assets, that are generally lower risk, it might not be worth it. So again, it's, it's kind of that cost benefit analysis. It's, it, it's if we understand um, the life cycle and we understand the costs of everything, we can say whether it's worth it to renew or not. Councilor? Thank you, that's all for now. Uh, thank you very much, Jordan. Thank you, Councilor Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Uh, I agree this was an excellent presentation and thank you very much for the detail. Um, and really underlining the importance. My question uh, and area of interest is underground infrastructure and um, how extreme weather is going to put that uh, under strain. And I guess in general, the whole question of climate change. Um, this is a, it's a, I won't say it's a new component because it's been understood for a long time, but I think probably in asset management planning, it's a relatively new factor to consider. Um, so are you trying to put a cost on this um, so that we can ensure sustainability and reliability and prevent flooding? Ms. Wayne Van Kessel? Through you, Mr. Mayor. So from my understanding, and I may ask Ms. Mihail to speak to some of this, is that stormwater is one of the areas that's most impacted by climate, uh, climate change. And as you remember, a few months ago, Ms. Mihail had a, a report that came forward on stormwater and stormwater management. And that identified a number of areas where we should be looking at closely and making sure that we're building an appropriate asset management plan to make sure we have the assets that we need in place that will prevent from some of those climate change impacts. So uh, I'm not sure if Ms. Mihail would like to add to that. Anka? Uh, yes, for you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mayor. Yes, of course, it, it all comes to uh, what has been discussed here before, uh, data uh, collection and condition assessment. And, and to know what we own, and uh, what we have to maintain and, and also what is the condition. And um, looking at the uh, extreme weather and climate change, um, what we've done with our stormwater management inventory, it was to assess it uh, with a consultant and to assess different assets. Um, we looked at... Um, stormwater management ponds. Now they are under investigation and assessment with, uh, uh, together with Conservation Authority and, and uh, Operations uh, Division. Uh, we look at the um, uh, stormwater um, uh, uh, pipes and, and underground infrastructure and um, at the age of this infrastructure how was built, when was built, what was the technical um, design criteria for that infrastructure, and what is the requirement now from Ministry of Environment and Conservation Authority. And all these data and, and the condition of the asset and, and the uh, master plans that we have, uh, this will help us uh, uh, look at what we need to uh, upgrade, uh, how we need to maintain and prioritize the, the infrastructure in such a way so we are prepared for extreme weather and, and, and uh, mitigate climate change uh, effects. Councillor? Um, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure that we can actually assess all of our underground infrastructure. Um, I think in some cases, we don't even know where some of it is, uh, perhaps not pertaining to flooding, but is there, I guess, is there a standard formula that um, communities before us have adopted for uh, just as a placeholder for climate change? And the other question is, um, you were, not you, but, um, talking about uh, risk, global risk manage the risk management report, the Canadian portion. Um, I think it was said that we were going to have an idea of how Aurora is doing in that context. Inka, did you want to answer that or? Um, I will. I will start. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
we um, council knows that we have an, uh, um, uh, a study underway to look at the climate change mitigation and impact of, on on our infrastructure. So this is what we are we are doing now with the consultant. Look, uh, we look at the um, all our core assets. Um, stormwater uh, infrastructure, water and wastewater, and the impact will have a climate change on this infrastructure. And where are the risks? Where are the um, um, points that we need to act now to be prepared uh, to mitigate climate change uh, uh, Facts and and this is what it's it's uh, it's uh, underway uh, together with our consultant and we will have a, a plan um, to mitigate on on climate change. Councillor, um, I can't go uh, back in my memory, but I but when you brought that very comprehensive plan that and the consultant was excellent. I think it was a 20 to 25 year plan. And at the time, council was saying, well, you know, maybe some areas that's too long to wait. So um, I do have concern over that. If um, a strategy to protect the town is going to have to go out 20 or 25 years, in my opinion, we're going to be in trouble. So is it possible that it will, through the asset management planning, that we will be changing that? Ms. Mayor Van Kessel. So for you, Mr. Mayor, the biggest challenge with the stormwater work that was identified within the plan is the current state of the reserves and the affordability. So it's a matter of um, how much we wanna be able to contribute to reserve to be able to complete these capital works. So if we identify and council's desire is we need to move ahead with some of these items, then we need to look at a funding strategy to be able to do that, which may mean um, looking at different storm increases to stormwater rates. <laughs> Councilor? Yes, we have looked at that and we've done something about that, but you're right, maybe we need to do more. But as we all know, we were talking about service levels and public feedback. Everybody wants everything and nobody wants to spend the money for it. I, I'm guilty. Um, so it's really a challenge. Um, but we will be taking a relook at that during this asset management planning. Ms. Mayor Raven Kessel. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So part of the reserve funding for this, this will be some of the work that comes out of the fiscal strategy and more information on the fiscal strategy coming to council on June 1st. Councilor. Thank you. Sorry for my cricket. Um, is there anything uh, with respect to risk? Is there anything um, uh, we've got the general for Canada. Is there anything that really stands out with respect to Aurora? Ms. Van Through you, Mr. Mayor, as the plan comes forward and we've done that more comprehensive analysis, including the Aurora data, then that will provide some more insight into where we stand and where some of those risks are. Um, as Maya indicated earlier, some our, a lot of our underground infrastructure was built in the 90s or earlier. The, that comes home to roost, usually around 80 years later. So it's a matter of doing some of that long-term planning. And again, this is something that also feeds into the fiscal strategy um, presentation coming to council on June 1st. Councilor? Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Thompson, second time. Thank you. Um, one of the early slides talked about the roles and responsibilities for council, and one of the bullet points was the approved levels of service metrics and KPIs. Uh, again, going back to the 2018 asset management plan, you know, one of the things that it really didn't um, identify were, you know, I guess standardized KPIs or metrics or at least best practices mm -hmm. for municipalities. And I, partly, I'm sure, because um, as was indicated, you know back then not a lot of municipalities were ahead of the curve in terms of this development. So my question through you, Mr. Mayor, to, to Jordan is when uh, you present the, uh, the asset management plan with staff, 
Will you also be recommending or identifying uh, KPIs that have been standardized or utilized by most municipalities or, or best practices? Because I, I certainly know for myself, and it's been mentioned by many others around the table, that you know, we do look for those metrics and KPIs to help us you know, assess and evaluate you know, performance and to help us make decisions. Jordan? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I can't speak to the particulars of the project because I'm not the one leading it, but I can speak more generally of what I see. Um, we do look at uh, standardized key performance indicators. The province through the OREG has set specific uh, KPIs to track things like average condition, um, percentage of properties resilient to different amounts of stormwater events. All those will be included and then, of course, there's there's a store of other metrics, um, you know, F FCM benchmarks, uh, different metrics. Um, so I'm not sure if this answers the question, but um, definitely there are we are aware of different kind of standardized metrics out there, and, and that's typically what we intend to use. Councillor, yeah, thank you. I mean, certainly having the KPIs or metrics allows us to put some context because sometimes it's hard when presented with data or numbers to really understand the value of that number unless you have something to compare it to, be it other municipalities around you of similar size and scope or those benchmarks and KPIs. So certainly, you know, to me that goes along with the collection of data, but also identifying, you know, those performance indicators so that you know, and we on council can can utilize that to make better decisions. And it looks like Mr. Gardner wants to chime in. I was just about, yeah, I was just making sure, <laughs> Mr. Gardner. There is, Mr. Chair, I, I just gotta mention in terms of our, our, our current uh, uh, effort, uh, we have uh, looked at what some of the other municipalities have done in, term, in regards to uh, uh, various measures that they're considering. And we've, and we've actually, factor that into some of the work we're doing right now. We, we, there's also a whole suite of measures that are mandatory under the regulation that we have to use as part of our, our asset management plans. So we're considering those, of course. So to answer your question, uh, Councillor Thompson, yes, we are looking at what others are doing in terms of measures they've developed. We actually started out with a considerable number of measures and we're just whittling it down now uh, using various lenses such as uh, information availability and and what's practical to collect in terms of information. Councillor? Great, thank you again. Thank you. Councillor Gilliland, second time. Thank you. Um, just really comment, uh, some of my questions were already answered through that roundabout, but uh, I wanna thank Councillor Gardner for um, bringing up the stormwater management uh, uh, global risks. That's a chart that I had written a note down here about um, how great this thing was. And I, I guess uh, I'll just make a comment about the top nine uh, likelihoods and impact um, that's out of the top nine, six are all weather and environment related out of the nine, which is pretty crazy to think that um, there's that many uh, risks involved in how we look for with our asset management and just our livelihood in general. So I, I do look forward to, you know, what the report's going to bring back and, and I, and especially from um, Ms. Mihale about the, uh, what it's, what is specific to Aurora and the climate adaptation and mitigation plan. Cause I think that's really going to strongly affect where we prioritize our money and an infrastructure protecting for flooding. And, and I think the one presenter called it the forgotten child of the underground. <laughs> so that definitely yeah. is going to be affected and it could be affected much quicker than maybe we could predict based on some of the old infrastructure. So I'm assuming Ms. Mihail, that is something that we're taking consideration just based on um, the global risk report that's been um, release that actually could change the way we view our stormwater management system what would be traditional versus what we're facing now. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, of course. We, as I said, we are 
uh, investigated all these, investigating all these with the, our consultant, and we looked at uh, what impact will have on our stormwater infrastructure, what climate change, and uh, and you know a change in the you know storm patterns and intensity and frequency of storms will will cause to our stormwater infrastructure and and our linear infrastructure storm pipes, and uh, we are going to have a, a plan and and definitely we are going to um, look together at these conclusions in 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 regard to asset management and what we need to prioritize but it to to address these issues and in order to be prepared but it all comes to costs and how much money we are we have and we are willing to spend to to address the issues yes, Thank you. And I really hope that, you know, just moving forward with, you know, our council and our next council moving forward, that we really take the steps to ensure to set some um, capital aside in anticipation that that's where we're going to need to spend a lot of our money moving forward. Um, it is pretty scary to think aside from natural disasters and such, um, other buckets are, you know, water, you know, how it's going to affect our drinking water, that kind of a crisis. And, um, our biodiversity as well in our ecosystem. So there's just such a, a big circle of things that it's going to affect and we really need to make sure we plan ahead. So if we are faced with these crises in this bucket zone, which is why I really appreciate this um, graph here that um, with in respect to our infrastructure, when it comes to just basic human needs, we have to look out for that as well. Obviously looking forward to um, the report moving forward. And uh, I mean, I think uh, Councillor Thompson had also spoke about, you know, other levels of government and funding as well, and, and hopefully we'll be able to capitalize on some of that with, the, <laughs> with what's, what we can moving forward. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Councillor Gallo, second time. Just really quickly, I'm not sure how meaningful this is, but it, it stood out to me on page 34, the, the replacement profile and the 10 year capital reinvestment plan, it says that as of 2018, Aurora has a backlog of 67 million. Um, ha have we made headway uh, on that? Uh, what's the status of our current backlog? Ms. Moira Van Kessel? Or do you want me to go to Mr. Artner or Anka? <laughs> <laughs> Through you, Mr. Mayor, I'd like you to go to Mr. Gartner. He was here okay. when the 2018 plan was done. Okay, Mr. Gartner? Uh, through, through you, Mr. Chair, the, so the 2018 plan was, represented a, a snapshot in time in terms of what our, our requirements looked like at that point in time, our replacement plan looked like at that point in time. I think since that time, uh, we have continued to, to, to you know, put a dent in our, in our replacement. The, our biggest challenge is, uh, I would suggest, is our assets continue to age? And... Uh, even two years ago, our assets were two years younger and, le and less stuff had kind of come under our radar screen uh, in regards to requiring replacement. Uh, so how much of a debt we put into it, I, I would suggest we were somewhat uh, minor uh, from the number that, that, you, that uh, Jordan quoted to you from 2018. Uh, I, I think the, uh, some of the clarity will come again under our fiscal strategy that we're working on because we're going to be looking past a 10 year horizon uh, which will probably cause us to get a clearer picture as to what our infrastructure gap truly is, uh, especially when we, when we look, uh, uh, say, 20 years more into the future from where we stand today and allow us to prepare for it more effectively, that, that gap. Uh, in terms of the $67 million uh, gap, uh, Jordan, you know, were those immediate uh, replacements that were needed is that where that number came from specifically? Jordan? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so those, the backlog is, I believe for this AMP, it was, um, so replacement only strategy. So that, so that backlog is just everything that has not been replaced that should be replaced. So for example, if we have a road that, we're saying should last 25 years and it's already 30 years old, it'll be part of that backlog. Also? 
Yeah, I, I just noticed some things on there that 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 we have invested in, and and, and uh, is the July meeting going to update us on the fiscal strategy uh, and update those kinds of reports for you, Mr. Mayor? Ms. Maria Van Kessel. Through you, Mr. Mayor, so there are two key meetings that are going to be coming up. So on July, on June 1st, we'll be bringing forward the fiscal strategy, which is more the financial objectives that we're looking at building all our future plans on, financial plans. And it's going to have a number of work products that come out of it. And part of it is the work that we're doing on this asset management plan and what we're trying to establish through this work that we're doing now. In Ju July is when we will be bringing the, the draft plan, which will identify the areas that we're going to measure for different service areas. So that'll be the document that comes out of the work that's ongoing for the second generation plan. So there's a couple of key pieces coming forward over the next few months. Joseph? And through Mr. Mayor, will either of those reports shed light on, on a more current uh, backlog? Ms. Maria Van Kessel? Oh, Mr. Gardner, you jumped in. I'm assuming you want to answer that. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I, I, I just wanted to mention uh, the updated asset management plan that we're going to bring in July. Will uh, it'll, it'll provide an updated uh, estimate of, of the condition of all of our assets, as well as an updated replacement cost estimate. So it will it will also provide a, a better idea as to uh, uh, that future replacement that needs to be done for the town. Councilor? Okay, thank you. And the only other thing is that if, if we are gonna do any public engagement, maybe we should put it somewhere inside, you know, the next steps on that chart on, on the last page or, or, or someone just identifying that before 2025, we will be engaging the public. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, can I get a motion just to receive the presentation? Councilor Gardner, Councilor Thompson, uh, before I call a vote, I just gotta say, I just want to add the fact that um, absolutely 60% on the municipalities, 10 cents in taxes, it's unsustainable. And we need all levels of government. And I can tell you from talking last week with the, with the deputy premier on the provincial side, uh, and, then, and then talking to the prime minister uh, uh, the next day, there's one thing that's quite clear and evident is that it's time to put people over party. They, everyone needs to come together. Everyone needs to do what's important for us to get everything that we need done for right across the country, never mind our municipal, all municipalities. And it's gonna take all three levels of government to do it together. Otherwise it's never gonna happen. And so I'm hoping that people start to realize that it, partisanship is not healthy and will not help us achieve what we need to do as, as municipalities, as a province and as a country. So uh, we're gonna continue that battle and hopefully everyone will come to a realization how we can all work together. So thank you for the, the presentation. I'm looking forward to the report just as everyone else is. And with that, I will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed, that carries. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Councillor Thompson, Councillor Gilliland, all those in favor? Opposed, that carries. We are adjourned. We'll see you tomorrow, everyone. Have a good day. Good night.